Um, I'm turning it over at this point to Anna Steele and Jeff Hope. Thank you so much for coming out to do this presentation. Howdy, Great. thanks. Thank you, Sart, and thanks, Jeff, for joining me today. Um, so today, uh, as Sart said, we're talking about technology projects as teachable moments. So how can we take the technology projects that we all do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and really learn from each other, right? We all understand that there's value in this, um, and we want to make sure that uh, we are opening up our community to make sure that uh, folks are comfortable talking about those technology projects that may not have gone as planned. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, right, so Anna Steele and Jeff Hogue, we had our introductions. Jeff's on video. Apologies, I'm not on video. All right, so why are we having this conversation today? Why does it matter? Um, we, as a community, I mean, I personally think that we don't talk about those projects that don't go according to plan, those projects that are, that are failures enough. Um, we talk a lot about where we succeed. Um, we talk a lot about kind of the quote-unquote intelligent failures, um, but we very rarely in a public forum kind of sit down and say, we goofed up, and this is why, and this is what went wrong, and this is how I would do it over again if I could. You know, obviously those conversations are probably having, happening within each other's organizations and behind closed doors and in the privacy of a, a Zoom meeting, but I think in the, in the public space, Jeff and I really want to encourage these conversations to start taking place. So that's why we're here today. We're st kind of starting that conversation, starting to talk about these projects, um, and to really kind of get the dialogue going. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that um, something I, I really like about this community, I think makes it special, is we want to be innovative and we want to do interesting things. And and at the same time, we're, we're we want to be good stewards of the money that we're entrusted with. So we want to balance that. We want to be innovative. We want to try new stuff. We want to take risks. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we we also want to make sure that we're making wise choices. And and uh, a, a real good way to to do that, I think, is to to know from each other what has gone wrong in other projects, so we can uh, we can spend our time well. And so as people, right, we love blooper reels. We love outtakes from our favorite movies and TV shows. You know, I'm pretty sure America's Funniest Home Videos is still on cable somewhere sometime, right? This is something that, that we like to, to, to do and talk about and witness. And while, you know, obviously a lot more is at stake when we're talking about federal money and technology projects and helping clients, right, rather than my dad's wipe out in, in a barefoot run. Um, it's still, I, I really That's actually want... your dad. That's actually your dad barefooting there, huh? Yeah, it is. Nice. <laughs> um, so I think that we, we want to kind of treat it like that, right? And again, while a lot more is at stake, and I wouldn't want to call it our legal aid technology blooper reel, right? Because frankly, sometimes when these projects fail, it's just not funny. Um, it is still kind of a way how I want to kind of frame our conversation today, uh, thinking about um, kind of going through a number of, of types of projects and, and talking about that. So. Um, yeah, and shout out to my dad for sharing some of his uh, <laughs> water ski failures, which you'll see throughout the day. So before we jump into the projects, uh, let's kind of define. I wanted to kind of have a discussion about defining failure. It means something different to everybody. I think, right, obviously when a project just doesn't happen, right, that at its core is, is a failure, but a project that... Um, ends up happening and a tool that ends up getting built, I think can still have aspects of it that are considered a failure. And I think that um, since a lot of the technology projects that we work on are grant driven, right, that really sets the context for failure um, pretty strictly um, in that like here are the numbers that we're expecting to hit, right, here are the milestones that we're expecting to hit, um, here are the amount of hours that we're spending, potentially going to be spending on this project, right, and 
is it appropriate for us to be considering each one of those individual milestones that don't get checked, right? Is that project a failure? Um, so I think kind of defining what makes a project a, fa a failure is really important. And I, I just want to say thank you, Anna, for pulling this, this topic together because it's so frustrating now. You see my gray hair. It's very frustrating to go and hear about the initiatives that people are thinking about adopting. And maybe I had a conversation just last conference with somebody else about like, oh, actually, that this thing sounds good, but here's what we experience in reality. Um, so I think it uh, can only be helpful for us to share the, the real deal uh, stories with these. So go ahead, Anna. And so getting into real deals, right? So I'm going to take us through five different categories of projects. And we're going to talk about what those look like when they fail and why these types of projects fail. None of these are specific projects. While I was putting this together, I did not have specific projects in mind. So if you're sitting at your desk being like, ah, she's talking about me, I'm, I'm not, at least not directly. Right, we may have I had. Did. I did, but Anna wouldn't let me actually talk about them. I am so. So these are all. These are all uh, names are changed and obfuscated to protect the innocent and the guilty. Yes, yes. But with that being said, right, this is the last time that I want to give this presentation where we're keeping it uh, very general and very confidential. I think the most value will be had in this type of conversation when one of us is either moderating a panel full of people who are excited to talk about their project went wrong, or either of us are sitting on a panel that's being moderated by somebody else where we're talking about uh, specific projects in which, which um, we failed, because I have. And I think, you know, I'm not going to speak for Jeff, but, <laughs> um, you know, we've all had things that have, that have gone a little sideways. So um, with that being said, let's talk about online intake, right? So, and again, these are not necessarily things that um, are definitely considered failures in the context of this project, right? This is just what we could, what a failed online intake project could look like, right? So very low usage from your clients, right? You're not getting the clicks that you expect, um, or maybe you're getting the clicks that you expect, but you're not getting the um, completion rate. It's a low completion rate, right? So people are starting it, but not finishing it for some reason or another. Um, a failed online intake project could have completed online intakes, but there's a significant number of errors in them, and it ultimately takes your intake worker longer to intake that person than it would had they just initially called on the phone, right? One of the reasons that people move to online intake is to try and create efficiencies within their intake system, right? So one may think that making their intake system ultimately less efficient is a, is a failure of the tool that was supposed to make it more efficient. Um, and, and another one kind of is a low conversion rate uh, to cases after follow-up with an intake worker, right? Someone may, uh, that may be why we wanted to do, take this online intake project, right? That we're screening out people online so the person does not have to talk to them. Well, in some cases, right, people may not be properly screened out and we still may be talking to them and we still may not be converting that case. So again, uh, may not be considered a project failure as a whole, but maybe something that one may consider to be um, not exactly meeting their expectations. And so why does this happen with online intake, right? I think the big one is uh, a lack of buy-in from the proper stakeholders within the organization. Um, if you're an organization that uh, has multiple offices and you've had one office that decides that they want to take on online intake alone, but online intake, the, that means the link has to get buried on the website. It's not going to get the clicks, right? Um, a lack of organic traffic to your website already, right? Or where you decide to post it. If you're nervous about the flood of intakes that may come in as a result of online intake, so you take your online intake link and you hide it in a deep corner of your website, you're going to get low usage, and then you're not going to be able to collect the data not only are you not going to be able to, to serve those clients, but you're not going to be able to collect the data to make your online intake better ultimately. And now, another I want to hear, oh, hear somebody tell that story, you know, right? We're all, people are always worried about the flood. I, I do seem to recall in the very early days in Washington State, they felt like it was, it was, it was a lot, like the volume went from, you know, went from zero to a lot. But I haven't heard, I haven't heard a story yet where somebody's like, we spun up online intake, it was this giant flood, and... And now we think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> so, you know, 
would that we would have that problem. I wonder how many have failed because everybody got nervous and buried it and didn't think that they're going to have to um, publicize and you know uh, the, the the existence of this uh, instead of thinking the other way around. So exactly, exactly, and um, yeah, for sure. And I think that the the last kind of why online intake projects potentially fail, and I'm definitely not the first one to say this. Right, but the lack of user testing, user-centered design, you know, making sure that it is presented in a way that makes sense to the user users, you're looking at plain language, right, things like that. If uh, there's all sorts of data around this, and, and we're not going to get into this on the call today, but just um, wanted to, to highlight that. Um, Jeff, anything else to add on online intake? Yeah, I think... I, I have an opinion about why some of what what some failures look like, which is um, a lot of people get nervous that you're going to publish this thing to the world, and then it becomes a really large committee of people doing design. And I, I think you there's a real chance of it not being plain language, not being very navigable, uh, and being difficult to maintain if there's too many cooks in the kitchen. This is one of those where I think. A, a well-finished online intake interview is a piece of art, and so if there isn't if there isn't a head artist, a head architect, or a head chef who's who's who become passionate about it because they think, oh, what if somebody has a small estate that's under twenty thousand dollars, but they inherited it five years before, or it's timed out, and they start thinking of those sort of scenarios and how to 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 um, to deal with that. I think that's a uh, so. Somebody needs to have the. I think. I think it helps to have somebody with the art who is invested with the artistic sort of sense of how it should flow and the passion to to drive it into something that it's a. It, it is. It's a work of art. It's a. It's a. Should be a beautiful thing. Absolutely, and I think the exact same thing applies to our next one, which we're looking at, which is document assembly. Um, so, I think that a failed document assembly project can look somewhat similar to an online intake project in the in the what it looks like, right? Low adoption. Um, the interesting thing about document assembly, though, is that doesn't need to just mean low adoption with clients, right? A lot of people use document assembly projects internally, um, and so you can have a lot lack lack of adoption by the advocates who you designed the document assembly forms for. Um, there can be a low acceptance rate by the courts, right? If you're creating this uh, document assembly for clients to use and then they take their, their uh, packets to file and the courts aren't accepting them, right? There's been some sort of breakdown there. Um, and then while this may not be something that you can say is at launch um, regarding whether the project is success or failure, but the uh, ones that lack updating and maintenance, right? The law changes. And, you know, Jeff was saying that you have to have somebody who has that sense of ownership that doesn't end when the project ends either. And I think that's a big, and I think, and, you know, again, no breaking news here, but I think that that's a big, a big issue within the community when it comes to document assembly. Yep, and there's been, you know, there's been a lot of efforts to, to, do document assembly. I, I can think of one that I made. <laughs> spent a lot of time on that. Basically, no one, no one adopted. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Apparently, someone's calling me. <laughs> um, so why these? So why these um, document assembly projects can fail? Right be, uh, beyond what what Jeff and I were just talking about. Um, you know, uh, the lack again, like online intake, the lack of buy-in from the right people. Um, you know, that court piece, not having the right stakeholders at the table. You want to make sure that you have ad internal advocates who are comfortable with this. You want to make sure you have external parties who are comfortable with this at the table. Um, and, uh, and Jeff, with, if you want to talk a little bit about, with Document Assembly, the uh, lack of testing prior to selecting the platform. Yeah, so just uh, I keep on the um, uh, online intake. I know we're avoiding kind of pointing out where those failures are, but is there a project out there that you would say really epitomizes that um, work of art as an online intake, one that you think is, has done a good job and that you're happy to kind of show off as that work of art? Well, for, that I've made personally, not the moment, um, but um, 
I, you know, I think I think that something that I helped with with the um, New York City Consumer Help Finder is it is it is really succinct. Like it's intentionally succinct. It was some people who did do consumer work down in New York City at at uh, it's at, at nychelpfinder.org or nyhelpfinder.org, either one. Uh, there was some unity of 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 it, mostly in being trim. And uh, another example, I, I think the A two J the uh, A two J project in New York. It also happens to be in New York. Um, I, I don't agree with everything that my friends Rochelle and 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 in the court system did with their DIY project in New York. But there's there's unity. If you look at any of their interviews, there's similarity there because it's the same author primarily who worked on those across all the interviews. And I think any you, you may just make some other decisions, but I think the DIY ones in New York are somebody who's focused on on consistency across interviews too and really thought through all the pieces. Um, so anything else on uh, document assembly, Jeff? Yeah, well, I know we're going to go over time, whatever. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so platforms, you know, these... I think it's worth, it would be wonderful if, if all these projects were structured a, a bit more so you could go and do uh, real life testing, you know, to do your pre-built testing because you may discover that, like, so Hot Docs is super complicated and can do anything. It's also got a high learning curve. How many people in your on your staff are going to learn to be experts in Hot Docs? Not so many. It may be that you'd have way more, way better sustainability and adoption with a, a much simpler platform like using um, A2J Author and its back end or using um, uh, Doc Assembler, one of those. But if you don't, if you haven't tried to take, you know, your most complex form and spent some actual time trying to build out in it, you don't really know what those things are, what those hurdles are going to be. So it'd be, um, it'd be really nice to, to have that. And, and I think for all these projects, you have to be willing. Unfortunately, we have to make all these decisions up front. We don't really have much of a structure for this is the time during which we do proof of concepts on multiple platforms to figure out which one's going to work. Yeah, and that I think that that's definitely not exclusive to document assembly either. And that's going to come. That's going to be a theme today for sure. Um, next type of project we're going to look at is our uh, pro bono collaboration projects. Right, these. Uh, are especially with the um, LSCP BIF grants, right? We're starting to see a lot more pro bono projects come up, uh, many of which involve the use of technology um, because it makes a lot of sense, right? And so when I'm talking about uh, pro bono collaboration, I'm talking about uh, pro se clinics, I'm talking about uh, kind of the urban rural partnerships, I'm talking about uh, posting pro bono opportunities on your website or on a, a main kind of website where you can, uh, where pro bono attorneys can pick up cases. Um, so that's what I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about pro bono collaboration. And so what does a failed pro bono collaboration technology project look like? Uh, services to clients aren't increasing, right? We're doing this with the idea that we're going to be able to serve more people and we're actually not. We're just creating an administrative headache for people and not serving more clients, right? That I would probably consider something like that to be a failed project. Um, your internal attorneys are not referring cases out to whatever pro bono project you have created. And we'll talk a little bit more why that could happen here in a sec. Um, there's little to no private attorney interest, right? You've created this platform or you've created this clinic or you've created this model and you can't get private attorneys involved, which means the service that, you're, that you wanted to provide isn't going to be provided or there's low pro, uh, private attorney retention, right? So you said um, that you want to do this, you have some pro bonos involved, but you can't keep those pro bonos involved. And I think why we see some of these issues is with A, with pro bono projects, um, there's a lot of replication, which is great. And we should definitely be encouraging replication. But with pro bono projects, there's there are many, many, many more kind of variables involved than your standard technology projects because you're dealing with that outside variable of pro bono attorney involvement. And so we can't just be blindly replicating pro bono projects. We really have to think through how your pro bono environment would accept or reject the concepts behind that project. Um, 
Jeff thought? Yeah, and this one, this one, I think this area suffers more than some of the other ones with this. And I think it's because you get uh, lawyers who move in the corporate world, right, um, who I think, frankly, just kind of presume that the technology in legal aid is way behind and, and maybe presume, you know, benevolent, benevolently presume that there aren't folks like the people on this call who've thought really hard already about how to solve these problems. And so they get excited about, you know, connecting different and they come in with ideas, not, not with, not thinking that there's a whole tapestry to, to consider first before, um, before launching off with a new wrinkle. And it's happened over and over and over again, where especially in this space where I feel like, you know, you can make the decision that we need another X, you know, we need another something uh, that's different, but at least, you know, I, I, I think, I think how, what failure looks like in this space is frankly, there's likely to be sort of a whisper campaign of like, you know, they're doing exactly what platform X, Y, and Z do. I'm not really sure why we need to, you know, put time and resources towards yet, yet another platform. I, I think, I think it kind of comes out in the wash eventually. So some, as a matter of fact, I called Mark O'Brien once. I was like, hey, Mark, I just read that somebody did this for the first time in the world. Did you know that? Because I've heard of this thing called pro bono net, and that's you. <laughs> you know, like, that doesn't mean you can't, that doesn't mean we can't all uh, have innovative projects or, or projects that, that are do the same thing in a different way. But I think it's, it, it's, it's got doom written all over it if uh, the community has already worked hard on some other uh, platforms that are working for them, and then suddenly, um, mana you know mana from heaven look here's a new tool that's different i, I think you guys hit on a really good point especially with the public private uh, partnership um a lot of times people will jump in offer services be willing to throw up a website or do something without surveying the landscape of what's out there what type of advice do you have for people doing that environmental scan where should they go what should they look for how do they avoid the massive duplication of very, some of these even simple projects um, that don't have any like community support or background because they're duplicating features that are already out there in the community. Well, the great thing is even though they may not always all get along or maybe even consider themselves sort of competitors for the services, there's so many different pro bono coordinators in, um, in, 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 the bar association will have have a pro bono program like those people know what projects exist if you literally just called three people the biggest legal aid program in your area and say what do y'all do for pro bono what kind of technology tools are y'all using the bar association and and one of the um uh, other partners i think you'd find they'd tell you who you need to talk to and it's so worth it even if you disagree with everything all those people told you because you're sure that a virtual reality headset version of a meeting with a lawyer is going to be the thing tomorrow. Um, those people all know what's been tried, what failed, who put the kibosh on it if they did. So it's, it's honestly, it's mostly picking up the phone and or buying me a beer at a conference. <laughs> and the one last thing that I want to add to the pro bono piece is uh, your expectation setting. And this is something that I personally ran into when running a pro se clinic is we like to use the whole this is so easy you can come on your lunch break and spend an hour at this clinic and you can help five people during this hour we like to use that or uh, you can help people from your fuzzy bunny slippers at home uh, after hours like we like to use those as carrots with pro bono attorneys but if that's the expectation we're setting then why are we expecting them to come back to another clinic, right? Why are we expecting them to put five hours into something that uh, they have five hours to give, but maybe only spend, you know, half an hour on it because I have set this expectation that like this is a quick and easy thing that you can do on your lunch break and still be helping people, right? So I think it's really important that if we're going to use that, that as a carrot for the pro bono community to get involved in our projects, that, um, we make sure that we're setting the expectations that like we're still expecting you to work at the top of your practice um, just because you're doing so in your bunny slippers. So I think that that's um, uh, something to consider, especially with with the technology projects where the um, 
oversight may not be as intensive as it was if someone was working a case on site. I've got slippers on right now, and I have worked very hard. <laughs> um, next one, uh, document management systems. So people are really making, we're starting to see this a lot. Um, I know at Just Tech, this is a request that we get a lot. I know, Jeff, at Legal Server, people are asking you about document management all the time, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, these projects can be super successful, um, but they, they can also have some bumps, just like the other ones that we've been talking about. And, uh, you know, what does a failed document management project look like? Like everything else, lack of usage. Um, anger and frustration from staff, right? When you're making a change to the way that somebody does their work on a day-to-day -day basis and people are mad at you, something has gone wrong, right? And we can't just say, well, all the people who are mad at me are the people who should have retired 10 years ago anyway, so it doesn't matter, right? That's, you have failed somewhere along the way if that's really your, your honest belief, right? Of course, we've all said that at one point or another, but if that's really, truly your honest belief, there's been some sort of oversight. And uh, one of the most dangerous failures of a document management project is secret noncompliance, right? So if, if you roll this out, and this is the expectation, and you're supposed to be saving things to, within the document management system or tool, and I've decided that I don't like that tool. So I've saved everything, I'm saving everything on my desktop, but I haven't told anybody that I'm doing that because I know that I'm not supposed to be doing it. And then my laptop crashes, and now I have no documents. And when I go to IT and tell them, they're like, well, isn't everything in the document management system? They're like, no. So, and, and there's, right, that is, there was some sort of failure there, right? Whether it's training or support or buy-in, right? If you're getting that secret non-compliance, there's some sort of some sort of failure there. So what causes a, uh, a breakdown in the document management project? Um, and I know, Jeff, you had some thoughts about this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I was <laughs> on, on uh, the secret non-compliance. You and I talked about this before. A long time ago, the ABA published a um, uh, tech, they publish it every year, but it's kind of not easy to get your hands on. It's expensive. You have to prove you're a nonprofit, then you can get it. But they do this huge tech survey. And one of them, it was uh, back when the cloud was new, it said, you know, how many, the, the percentage of, I think, medium-sized firms, I'm going to mess up the statistic, but it was something like 30% of them were offering some sort of cloud-based document storage for their, um, for their staff. And then in the survey of the staff, they asked, you know, what percentage of people who worked at medium-sized firms were actually using, um, were using cloud-based document storage, and it was like 70%. <laughs> so, you know, people were finding a path around the thing that was frustrating. And, and I'll, I'll just say about the document management, I, I, um, this is one of those things that, like, it is a good idea. We know it's a good idea. We know it can save time. Um, and it runs right up against human behavior which humans just, when you put your socks in your drawer, you don't go grab a label and stick a label on each sock that's like black, brown, multicolored. You just don't do it. Like you're in a hurry. You want to get this task done to get on to something else. And so if it relies on tagging or if it relies on people to do something that's really unnatural for them to do in a hurry, um, it, you know, it, it's just not going to work. And so there's times when you have something that's really good. We, you know it can save time, and, and maybe we, we haven't taken into account how big of a deal it is to change human behavior, especially in a stressful situation where they're trying to get something done and move on to something else. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff here, some really important points here. One is that your document management system should not add extra transactional costs for people if it does, they'll see it as a burden and not helpful, even if it saves them time, because every time they have to take an action, then they'll feel like their time is being sucked away from them. Additionally, the, one of the bigger failures around the systems that have kind of a communal space um, is lack of a community manager. You can't just build this great technology and expect everybody to start throwing stuff in and it to run itself. 
And by community manager, I don't mean you take somebody and throw it on top of their regular workload and say, hey, congratulations, you're excited about this. You get to do this five hours a week on top of your regular hours. You actually have to dedicate someone to work on those platforms um, or create a system that, that is search-based um, that takes where people automatically put stuff and comes up with relevant answers. It's one of the two. Totally agree. That's why I tell everyone you have to have a gardener. And I think I think if you don't have that, um, you, I, that's, I like the way you said that, right? If it's, the, the benefits have to be so obvious that people think it's worth changing a little bit how they do things. So. Sorry, Anna, um, we're missing with your timeline. Go ahead. No, no, please. <laughs> this is all, this is great. Um, and the one piece that I just want to add to this, and again, I think this is a common thread among any project, but not fully understanding your current practices and where they're working and where they're not working prior to building out a new tool. So if you decide to move into a uh, into SharePoint or a enterprise level document management tool and you don't know how attorneys are actually thinking about the way that they want to be organizing their documents uh, uh, and you're just replicating exactly how your local file storage looks, um, it's it's going to have the same problems as your local file storage, right? So I think that really understanding the pro processes and practices um, prior to, to jumping in the deep end is really important with this one. I'm going to make a pitch, by the way. If, if you've done a wildly successful document management system for real, like everybody's using it, everybody loves it, and you're happy, I, I really would like to hear hear about it. So please contact Anna or Sartan, and, and, and uh, I'd like to hear how it went because now we're – we're bumping up against all the different DMSs, and I'd love to hear it. Um, Jeff, tell us about the magic gizmo. The magic gizmo. So it, this is real. Like, this happens. There are apps. There are platforms that do something that's just so cool um, that you you really want to bring that, that new feature or tool in and, and make it work for you. Um, and... Sometimes it does, but I think the, um, uh, the the failure looks something like this. So you've gone to a, a webinar or a, a training or a conference or something, and someone's gotten up and given a really good presentation about why about this this very focused tool and what what it's going to do. And so you bring that enthusiasm back, and maybe there's dynamic people who who work on that, and and then you sort of square peg round hole it right so you so you bring back and like it's not a perfect fit for what we need um, maybe our computers are a little slow maybe they're not even going to actually be able to use this maybe maybe our network isn't sufficient to to, to handle uh, what this needs um, and then what happens is you the the, the, the failure is is that um, when you actually go try to implement it you find that you you're, you keep pointing to people pointing out to people how this could work and it doesn't work in reality. So you have, um, at the end of the day, you're left with, yes, there's this, this new tool or feature, but the staff was over oversold, right? So they think it's going to solve 15 problems and it sort of solves one. Um, or, or maybe, you know, the impressiveness that it had for you just doesn't translate into other efforts. And so one of the things that, that I think the a failure in this, um, vein looks like one of the ways the characteristics is that people who feel like they have a lot of other priorities for things they would like you to work on and problems you'd like to solve th this is a really dangerous thing i think for our whole our whole community is that there are folks who are just you know they're doing ssi hearings every day they're doing uh bankruptcies they're going into family court and what they want they want their paper file to be neatly organized. They want the notes to be good. They want somebody to, to help them with follow up, and they they want um, they want to win their cases. And now the tech person has delivered to them some app that's supposed to do something, uh, and that's not what they needed. And so I think one of the real dangers here is that um, one of the, the 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 earmarks of failure is that people who care about our mission just as much as you do are saying. Um, we need to. We don't need to be. We shouldn't be spending this time, effort, and treasure on on shiny things. And for some folks, that ends up that ends up putting a blanket over 
other technology initiatives, um, all because maybe we got enamored with uh, with the magic gizmo. And I think that being said, though, I th and I think that that you are very uh, much on track there. I think that we also can't. There's always going to be kind of that feedback, right? When we're spend when we as the technologists and the innovators are spending money on something, um, even if it is successful, and even if it is doing its job and doing it well and making our lives the lives of our clients better, right? There's still going to be those people who don't understand why we're spending money on the tech and not another attorney. Um, so I think it's kind of a, with the magic gizmo piece, it's kind of, it, there's a, there's a little bit of a balance there. Yeah. Sure. Oh, we all agree. Right. I, I remember, I remember when there was, a, there was a certain office that only one computer had access to email and it was, why do we need that? And then it was voicemail. Why do we, why would we want people to leave messages for us directly? There's no paper trail of what they said to us. And so clearly there's times when, you know, and oh my gosh, host it, host it hosted phone systems why would we do that so you know some of these things are good ideas that have to happen but if um if we don't talk about the risks and we don't we don't call out the limitations then um it maybe is a confirmation bias for folks that uh, oh those tech folks just see something new and then they spend time and effort yeah. well, I, I think part of the thing that i've seen in some legal aid organizations that has helped with that is when they um, reimagine their vision as serving more than just the clients who make it through the overcrowded um, intake or hotline hours when they're open, that there are tens of thousands of clients or eligible clients that need services in other ways. And when they view a broader community mission, there are some ways that technology can serve people 24 hours a day, or they can't make it through um, to an attorney. And that broader mission helps them evaluate technology in a different way. I see someone asked for a specific example. So I'll give you one that, I'll give you one. Um, what about, remember, uh, video conferencing, right? What we're doing right now and what now I do literally every single day. Um, there was a time when, you remember way, way back when, when it was, it was pretty weak. Um, the audio was mediocre. People didn't really think folks were going to want to communicate this way. Um, and I guarantee, I know for sure, around the country there were uh, video conferencing stations wheeled into various offices in different places. And the people who said this is the future, you know, like point to like, remember the Hudsucker proxy with the, the circle? And he's like, this is, um, people pointed to it and said, this is going to mean we can meet with clients who have difficulty getting out of the house. This is going to mean we can do conferencing. And, and, and in some cases, that probably became, just didn't happen, right? The usefulness was low. Somebody probably grumbled every time they passed that expensive piece of equipment. Um, and yet, and this is, I think, the nuance that Anna was trying to make sure we hit on, Video conferencing is the thing. It was the future. Um, uh, I suppose if someone, the, a, a mitigation uh, approach is to say, you know, we're experimenting. This is where things are going. We're going to need to build the use of this tool over time. And here's how you use it. And here's and here's how you get a get a couple of people excited about actually uh, adopting the the new technology. Yeah, and on video conferencing, right? Like so. I am, I don't think, well, I have, I had a first or second generation iPod, but I am not an Apple user. I don't love Apple products, sorry. But I give them so much credit for the video conferencing revolution because once people started FaceTiming everybody all and having that at the click of a button, all of a sudden people are okay video conferencing at work. It, was, it happened like overnight where you have people who are incredibly resistant to uh, to video conferencing in a professional setting, and then all of a sudden they're video conferencing everybody and their mother, and then they do it at work because that's the natural thing to do. And so I think that sometimes you just got to wait for that like cultural bump, um, and know that all along that you were right. <laughs> and you'll have it. I mean, somebody's going to show you an AI bot that's going to it looks like magic in the one little narrow. Uh, 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 
f piece that it works on and maybe it can be if that fits your model really well and you understand what the limitations are and, and I think and I think we, we um, express that and also say that it's kind of new and it's not going to be something that works out of the box every day you know with some of what we want I make magic gizmos I want want people to use them <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some of the, the common threads here, right? We've touched on a lot of these types of projects. We've touched on why they fail, but let's kind of take a step back and really uh, look into that, right? So lack of momentum, I think, is a big one that could apply to any of these projects. We all wear a number of different hats. Um, you know, many of the technologists in our space are also litigators, are also supervisors, are also executive directors. And so it can be very, very challenging to keep up momentum on projects. And, you know, we, all, we end up working for the deadline, working for the milestone, right? So a month before the deadline, it's full steam ahead, but the six months prior, we're just kind of, you know, at a, at a low simmer, right? So if you don't keep that momentum up and you don't keep that excitement up within the organization or within your project team, um, then you're going to have, I would say, I don't, I don't think that that's something that is going to cause failure right out of the box, but I think that there's a higher, or definitely a higher chance of failure if there's a lack of momentum around your project. Um, along the same lines, a lack of support. I think when, when Jeff and I were talking about this presentation together, um, we talked about the kind of 11th hour veto of the project. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to touch on that. I do. I do. Before everybody starts thinking about what they're doing next. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important. I can't tell you how many times I've been involved in something where we thought we, we thought we had we thought we had the blessing from everybody who needed needed to bless it and then um, really near the, the delivery of the project somebody says oh but it doesn't have this feature or it doesn't do this thing and um, and suddenly uh, really dramatically impacts the, the, the delivery or you know and with document assembly it could be uh, uh, if it's not a standard form it could be that one of the major courts in your area, won't accept that form that there and this happens we only accept a photocopied pdf of the official pdf that we deliver and unless you started at the beginning way back when with the lobbying on that um and then sometimes it's bosses this doesn't get publicized um, we don't talk about this but there's times when there's a top level boss is just like uh, we can't do this particular thing because it steps on the toes of a neighbor or um uh, I don't, I, we had, there was one project I was involved in where one of the partners felt that the way using it, in, it involved the transmission of data and just said, I don't believe that that's uh, ethical. That, you know, I don't think that the way that data is managed and stored um, uh, uh, leaves it in my control, so we're, we're not doing it. And it's just, yeah. Uh, and I, are we talking about how to avoid that? Whatever. I'm going to anyway. So, no. The 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 eleventh hour veto. We got to make sure that uh, um, all those people. I think that's part of running up the flagpole, like very early, sharing with everyone you can. Here, hey, this is what we're gonna do. This is basically how it's gonna work. And I hate doing that because you usually get a long list of here's what I think the problem is with your project, or you know, and you know, not very helpful ideas from people who don't understand what it's about. And like, I've got a vision, just shut up and let me run with it and then I'll show you and, and uh, run run up the flagpole to, to, to search for eventual vetoes is what I'm getting at to avoid that. Yep, yep. And I think, you know, unfortunately, uh, support in this situation can also mean monetary, right? If you don't have the grant uh, money or the, you know, super secret money tucked in the back of your sock drawer for the particular project, then it, then um, it, it may not work out. And you have to be realistic about that at the beginning, right? About what the funds are, what, how, much, how much money and how, how many resources it's really going to take get, to get done because you really want to do it right. And, you know, if you don't have the support, whether it's uh, resource support or uh, management support, then find 
but but you do think the project is a good idea and the people around you think the project is generally a good idea right feel free to break that project into pieces right and and get through step one with what you have and and then use uh step one and two to then create a great um explanation and grant application and presentation as to why you should should take it to step three um Next one here, misalignment of expectations. This again cuts many, many, many different ways. Um, I think that there can be a misalignment of expectations between um, individuals working on the project together. There can be a misalignment of expectations between uh, a vendor and the, the organization, between the funder and the organization, between funders and vendors, between organizations and clients, between vendors and clients, right? There can be, so, there's so many places where uh, expectations can get misaligned and um, this ties into the next one too um, so that's poor communication right but um, it's so important to get this the expectations out up front in your project and always be checking back to them right every yeah. time you know this is I our plan wanted, are we hitting it yeah go ahead Jeff I just wanted to add that uh, it's a trendy it's a trendy thing I don't know if you've done user stories before but I, I, some of these buzzwords make me crazy but I can't think of a better way to to have people early on. If I'm a user doing X thing, I want Y thing. Y thing is going to happen. Those sort of like plain language um, uh, here. I'm I'm a user. I'm doing X thing. Y thing is going to happen automatically within four seconds. Or uh, those having a list of those early on and getting them agreed to can really help. And I but at the same time, I'm also in favor of the old school. Um, specs, you know, specifications of what something's going to do, provided that you build in uh, refinement. Because the other way I've seen uh, uh, expectations get misaligned is there are people who think that a project isn't done until one person is 112% satisfied with every detail. And, you know, that's going to make all the partners crazy because um, there, one of the expectations has to be that what you deliver is going to be different than what you imagined in the beginning because you you're going to run into technological hurdles or you're going to your your user testing is going to tell you that something needs to be different um or something you thought was going to be easy um turns out you know like sms literally doesn't have in its specification the idea that it knows it's a reply to us to 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 a, a particular message you can't change the universe because that's what you desire in your project and so um, I think spelling out user stories, specs, and then also building in the fact that the expectations are going to have to change based on user testing and techno technological reality. For sure. And misalignment of expectations becomes even worse when there's poor communication, right? If, if you are not aligned... I wasn't, wasn't listening. What? <laughs> um, when you are not aligning your expectations properly and and you're not communicating well, forget about it, right? You're going to end up, it's that like classic uh, comic that I see everywhere uh, where people always use on like project management and agile presentations with the tire swing um, where like your expectation is one thing, this is what you think you're getting, this is what the client thinks they're getting, this is what you actually get, right? That whole idea and that's just made it 10 times worse by poor communication. So make sure you have a good communication plan with all of your stakeholders in your project, right? Over communicate. I know that we all get 6 million emails a day and a 6 million and first email is not what we are overly excited about. But I think that it's really, really important to keep your communication um, solid, else you're really opening yourself up to um, potential failure. And kind of the last common thread here, and Jeff got into this earlier, is just a lack of love for your project <laughs> and for the, the vendors that you're working with and for the, we're not asking for everybody to get along perfectly, but you really need somebody, you really need that champion. That project needs to have a champion. That project needs to have somebody who's willing to be there in the project through thick and thin and really get it to, to where it needs to be. Yeah, and it's also I, I think I think it, it 
all of all of us working together as humans also I think should start from the position, especially in this space, that we're all trying to do good work and so and do good things. And so the um, uh, uh, the approach. Nobody wants to work on a project. Nobody wants to be part of your test group. Nobody wants to adopt your technology if if there's a and I, look, I'm guilty of it. You people are all behind you. Catch up. <laughs> you, you've got to do this as opposed to I care about the problem you're having. I care about helping you try to solve it. Um, and I have I have passion for this project. And so that I'm, I you know turn. I know this is very nebulous, but turning those um, uh, if everybody feels like what they're working on is a project where you've got a big list and you're and you want to tell them uh, tell, and and you're going to tell everybody else how they're how they need to behave uh, and how they need to meet your needs. Like that's not everybody involved in the project from the user to your partners to the end users all have a need to fulfill. And if you are putting love in, you're listening to, the, to, to that need and you're trying to address that need, not merely impose your vision of how this thing should go and when it should be done and exactly what the details are like. And then hopefully your love for the project is infectious and other people love what it does. I, I can't believe I'm going back to SMS. I did not love SMS when we first built it in Legal Server. I was like, SMS is going to be gone in a year. We're going to be all, all you be using apps. SMS is, is a technology of yesterday. But, you know, it deep, does need stuff. That love that our clients had for it became infectious. And now, even in, in internally, when we build something new on top of SMS or we solve another problem or even just improve reminders that it, everybody has a good feeling about that because we know instantly people like this tool they're going to use it and 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 they tell us about how it has effects on how they deal with with folks so you know share the love share the love <laughs> all right so what's next right so how do we so we've talked about all of these projects right we've talked about how they fail and why they fail but how do we avoid that, right? And how do we how do we make sure that we're prepared if a project is going down a track that's uh, that's not looking not looking right? Um, yeah, Jeff, you want to start? Well, I, people are going to bail, so I'm going to give the real quick version. We got to be we, we need to get to a point uh, culturally where we have pre build testing and we're allowed to 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 not pick your platform, your tool, or your final specs until after you've had a chance to try different things. Let's let's get in there and 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 build prototypes before we commit to something. Because here's here's the the real truth is we all get embarrassed and or forced by you know political reality to to put a sunny face on something that didn't go well. When four weeks into the project, you realize that that. Um, you know, should have chosen a different platform or a different approach. So I, I think that's my that, that's the number one thing I would say. That and and having a conversation, even if it has to be privately over the phone or over a beer with somebody who's done something similar to get the straight scoop. Those are my those are my two major ones, Anna. Yeah, and I think that those, especially the pre-project kind of testing and planning and process analysis and all of that is wildly important because you find those red, you identify those red flags early um, instead of you know 6 12 18 months into your project and I think that that all also plays into um, assessing assessing the risk going into a project right and trying to figure out um, where there's where there is room for failure and making sure that it's being addressed early and right out of the gate as opposed to um, being surprised what if it sneaks up on you yeah, you know, people have talked about risk assessments for a long time. I always thought of it as something really boring, like what an insurance person would say. If you just think of it as a, I'm, 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 I'm a recent convert. I think if you just think of it as a, as a, what are the things that could go wrong, you know? And and have I? It's kind of a fun creative process. Like what what could, what are the points of failure that I need to look out for? Um, and then one nice thing about risk assessments is the person who's real skeptical about your project, if they see your the risk they're thinking of in your list, then they feel heard. Yes, definitely. And that goes back to the community. That piece right there is a thread that goes goes throughout this as well. 
Um, so wrapping things up right now. Oh no, my last picture didn't show. Um, so what if we fail, right? The first, one of the things I want you to do is um, email me, call me. I want you to be in my blooper reel. Like I want you to be sitting up here with, with Jeff and I talking about it. Like I, I, or call somebody, talk about it. Um, you know, make it, make it known. I mean, I know it's hard when you have to report back to a funder. Um, and you know, we all find the silver linings in our failed projects, um, to report and we report back on those silver linings instead of the fact that I just flat out failed and it was terrible. And I had one client use this tool in six months and, and I'm sorry, but I tried, right? Like it's, I talk about it. And that's, you know, that's, that's the reason that I wanted to put this together today. And that's the reason that I asked Jeff to, to be here today is that, um, I really just, I really just want us to talk about it more and not be, and not be uh, scared to say, to contact a funder midway through a project and say, listen, this is going down a path that, that isn't going to go well. And, you know, either like, let's talk about how to make this work or, I mean, if, maybe I'll give you your money back, ah, but it me like, it's so I can stop the project and pull the plug right because it's just not going to make sense and we need to be willing to like have those hard conversations with each other with our funders um and the like and and bosses and and i so so anna just made an ask and i i agree i promise if we do a follow-up of this one i'll bring i'll get the permissions i need and i'll bring an actual failure um uh, uh from from here at my time at legal server and 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 share that and I think if other folks would um, I think I think that it's a conversation that will help and I know it's happened but yeah don't want to duplicate what anybody else is doing anywhere else but I'm uh, very happy to do that all right I think that's that's all we have um, Sart, do you have anything else to add? Any questions come in? Um, definitely. I'd uh, like to open it up in case people have any uh, questions. Um, one thing that I would like to add um, on the failure side, and uh, I've seen this with way too many projects uh, recently, um, and, it's, and it's been going on for years, is the lack of inclusion for accessibility testing and actually using individuals with disabilities from professional organizations. If you are putting together a project and you've got a budget over $100,000, you should have accessibility testing from the beginning of that project. You don't wanna get halfway into that project or finish that project and then find out that individuals with disabilities have been left out of that. Uh, similarly, with court systems, I've often seen um, unrepresented litigants not at the table as a stakeholder. In Washington State, we designed a superior court case management system that had no way for an unrepresented litigant to log in and see their own case file. They had to have a bar number, and it took 18 months and 20 meetings of people making way too much money to fix that simple um, bug or uh, they didn't even see it as a bug at the time because they didn't really they didn't see unrepresented litigants which is 75 percent of people in family law cases as essential stakeholders to be brought to the table get people that are most disadvantaged in the current system and include them early and often in the process um, and somebody here just made a comment. Similarly, include people with cognitive disabilities um, as part of that. So, for example, uh, W3C standards um, doesn't have spell suggest, but as somebody who's extremely dyslexic, having that makes your product so much more usable, but also available to somebody like myself with dyslexia. So. Um, consider though a diverse group of stakeholders from the beginning and use them as actual testers. Thanks. Yeah, we 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 forgot to mention plain language as well, which is um, mm. yeah, I think Maria Maria um, Minlin said is the one who convinced me. You know, if 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 you said it, <laughs> but nobody understood it, 
you didn't say it, <laughs> you know, you didn't communicate it. And I, I think you're, you're, you're right that those, all of the, all of those, those um, are, are good points. And I'm really trying to come around to um, thinking of the, the person who has the hardest time dealing with your technology as, you know, not as the lowest common denominator, but as the highest expression of your skill and art is that you made it so well that um, someone doesn't have to, you know, be a digital native or, or have uh, a lawyer's vocabulary or have any of those other things that you wish every user had when they step into your system and use it. That, that, that's, a, that's success. Yeah, there's, there's another good comment here in the question section, uh, which is to uh, consider the term uh, readability also over plain language, because it's it's a lot more than just the language used. It's the way that it's structured on the page. It's using visualizations. It's using bullet points. Um, that whole presentation um, of it is, is more than just getting rid of that terrible jargon that we're all taught is useful in law school that actually makes it more difficult for our clients. Yep. yep. I, I agree. I agree. And, and you can't make anything perfect. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying at all. Uh, I, I think that um, where I would, starting with the accessibility and, and readability and plain language and all of the other things and thinking about uh, other languages and those things that have to be part of, of the plan and I think it's okay to uh, have that as part of the plan that is, um, um, you know, it, it, you don't, that is part of, part of your midstream or your refinement process. And um, it's also, mm -hmm. you know, it's also the case that if, if you get together and you talk about, you could make a list of requirements that's so long nobody can remember what you're building at some point. Right. <laughs> and to tie that into your project success. Right, be like, I am not considering this project to be a success until, you know, it passes these readability and accessibility standards. And like, that's a tall order, but it's an important one. For sure. Well, and I mean, guess what? There's so far, our, we the folks we work with say on some of them. It's an interesting thing about which project you choose, right? You can get into there's there's a whole bunch of ethics involved in which projects you choose and what you decide is important and what mm -hmm. that means for you and um, there are m mobile devices are still really problematic for accessibility definitely a whole nother webinar <laughs> <laughs> um, well thank you guys for coming out and speaking today uh, we greatly appreciate it and we should have this video up here within the next week on our YouTube channel. Uh, please feel free to reach out to the presenters as their emails are there. Um, if you've got any further follow-up questions, um, our next uh, webinar coming up is on Doc Assemble, and it's an update on how that um, system's working, new features that have been added. Um, the date for that. Uh, webinar is September 17th, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time, so same time as today, and as always, it is free. Uh, enjoy yourself, and have a wonderful weekend coming up here. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Sart, for organizing it.